uh, quick overview of water issues in China. I think it would be interesting to, to know about the big picture in a broader perspective, so you can come up with more comprehensive solutions for water governance. So before we dive in, I'm going to give a quick introduction about China Water Risk. We are a non-profit organization based in Hong Kong, but dedicated to address business and environmental risks in arising from China's uh, uh, urgent water crisis. And our aim is to foster efficient and responsible water use in China's uh, water resources. And we do this through a website by providing up-to-date information for free together with our network partners, such as uh, international organizations like WRI and uh, UNEP, and some local NGOs like uh, IP and Xingtao, and also some financial institutions like HSBC and I, uh, uh, IFC. So, over the past two years, water supply crisis has been listed as a top global risk according to the World Economic Forum. And according to a recent national survey, 81% of people are deeply concerned about the environment in general in China. And 87% of people are highly concerned over drinking water and food safety. And water issues are not only about pollution and environment, it's also related to food and energy and regional security. So it's not a surprise that the government declared war on pollution. Because water supply crisis is a real risk, but it is a risk to avoid at all costs. So we all know that we don't have lots of water on the Earth. Only 0.01% of water is fresh water. But how much water we have in China? We are looking at 2,047 kilometers per person per year. And this figure may not sound, uh, make any meaning to you. So we want to make it easier. We want to use bathtub terms. So in China, we are looking at 27.5 bathtubs per day, per person per day, which is similar to Iran. And in America, they can use 123 bathtub per person per day. If we look at the water use, American, based on the recent data, the Americans use 22 bathtub per person per day. So as the economy in China grows to the size of the, the US, we cannot use the same amount of water as the Americans do. So we have to do business as usual. If we continue with the business as usual, Experts said the demand by 2030 will exceed the supply. And not by just a little, it's a lot of it, uh, shortage. We are possibly end up with 199 cubic billion kilometer water shortage, which means by that time, we're not able to supply water for the whole population, which is the blue part, and one third of industry use. So the government wants to curb uh, water use by putting caps on the water used by 2015, 2020, and 2030. And on the other side, they want to also boost the water supply by planning to spend 14 RMB to upgrade the water infrastructure to 2020. Another measure is to use pricing as a tool to, uh, to regulate demand and supply. So this is a chart of the water price of major cities around the world. And the blue bar is uh, cities in America and the US, uh, Europe, Europe. And the red ones are Chinese cities, and the pink ones are other Asian, Asian cities. We like to uh, highlight the Singapore, because we think Singapore share the similar amount of water resource per person per day as Beijing and Shanghai. But the price in Singapore is set at a level that they have a uh, ability of financial revival to adopt uh, viable solutions such as sanitation and port water purification. And if we draw a line in Singapore, all the Chinese cities' water price fall below this line. So we were likely to see the price to go up, to go by two to five times increase. Actually, in 1st of May, the Beijing has raised its municipal water price, and at the high end, the price is already set at the level of Singapore. And on top of this, the Chinese industry also is not very water efficient. They use four to <coughs> ten times more water per unit of production compared to developed countries. So, but on the other hand, this also means there's a lot of room to improve. 
the reason we worry is because China is much drier than we think. The, the World Bank World Poverty Mark is defined as 1,000 kilometers per person per day, which means if the water resource of one country fall below this line, the water will become a severe constraint uh, on your economic development and food production and so on. So give you a, give you a better idea. So one standard Olympic swimming pool can fill up 2,500 cubic meters of water. So 1,000 is less than half of it. And if the water resource per person per day falls below 500, the countries are considered extremely scarce. So if we look at the provinces in China, 11 provinces fall below this 1,000 cubic meter water poverty mark. And six of them are extremely water scarce. And all the, we call these 11 provinces as dry 11, and they are located in the northeastern China. And we are looking at the average water resource around 310 to 431, which is comparable to the Middle Eastern countries. So we are looking at Shanghai, similar to Saudi Arabia, Jordan is similar to, the Tianjin is similar to Jordan, and Beijing is, has lower water resource compared to Palestine. On top of the water scarcity, China also faces serious pollution issues. So 50% of pollution, water pollution comes from agriculture. And also according to the national survey, nearly 20% of farmland is polluted. And just according to the recent State of Environmental Report published by the Ministry of Environmental Protection, nearly 60% of water is badly or very badly polluted, which means not fit for human contact. And also there's this pollution does not stay in the, in the region. It was will be carried by rivers to the sea. According to the Ministry of Environmental Protection status, there's uh, 77 tons of uh, arsenic in the wastewater discharge just along the Yangtze River. But according to another government statistic, there are 1,975 tons of arsenic carried by the Yangtze River to the sea. So the great discrepancy, probably due to different measurements, different monitoring, uh, parameters, but could also indicate maybe a legal discharge along the rivers. So the government has declared a war on pollution. We have been seeing new laws being passed and new standards being <coughs> set, and also some new targets from the 12 five years plan. So hopefully we see some changes on these pollution issues. So well, how, much, uh, how much impact will, will this scarcity and pollution have on our economy? If we look at the dry 11 provinces, they represent 38% of agricultural production. So any water crisis in these 11 provinces will have impact on food security issues in China. And because China is such a big agricultural producer, they will also impact the global agricultural trade. And these dry 11 also represent 51% of our industrial output. So they will have, we have this question, can we power this economy with such limited water resource? And can we still produce cheap products for the rest of the world? And in total, these dry land problems represent 45% of the GDP in China. So any water crisis in these 11 problems will have greater impact, not only regionally, but also globally. If we look at the map of China, everything is becoming clearer. So the Tibetan plateau takes up a big chunk of land areas in China because of its natural constraint and it's not very highly populated. And all the big rivers are located in the southeast, southwest of China where the transboundary waters are and the arable lands are mainly in the east. So just by looking at this map, you can understand that geographical limitations make the distribution of water resources in China unfair. And the resources in China is not even distributed between the north and the east. So the north and south. The south has more surface water and, and, and groundwater, but the north produces more crops than the south. And which makes north highly rely on the groundwater. This map shows the groundwater depletion in China. The darker the color, the severe the groundwater depletion. So the areas around Beijing and China is facing severe groundwater depletion. So the unfair distribution of resources adds complexity of water risk in China. Let's have a look at the water, food, energy nexus in China. 
And so this is a so the green green drops represent the top ten farming provinces in China. They represent sixty percent of the agriculture output. And on the industry side, the 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 dark brown ones are the top ten uh, industrial provinces, and they represent sixty eight of the industrial output in China. So we we are looking at five five provinces uh, from the top ten farming provinces located in dry land and. Six of them are located in the dry land from the industry, top industry province. If we look at overlapping, five of them are located in the dry land. If we put a rank on it, four of the top five farming provinces and three of the top five uh, industrial provinces are located in the dry land. So there will be a very big competition for water resources between agricultural production and industrial production. And if we add another layer, which is, which are the coal bases in China, in red color here, and five of them of these coal, top coal bases provinces are located in dry land, and coal mining needs lots of water. So which adds complexity or more pressure on the uh, water resources location? So who shall we prioritize? First of all, the people, and. We also have the basic need industry like agricultural commodity and power generation. And then comes the other industries. And if we look at the water use of these industries, agriculture and power generation use most of the water. And if we look at the water pollution, agriculture is also the top uh, water producers in China. So the government will definitely focus on the water intensive and protein industries to tackle these water issues. If we look at the water and energy alone, 80 percent of the electricity in China is consumed by the industry. And in 2010, 97 of the power generation is water reliant, which means which includes hydropower and thermal power generation. So according to the uh, estimation, if we China grow its economy according to the Americans model, we will probably end up with uh, energy demand at 4.75 terawatts, which is shockingly huge. But the government realized it and they uh, want to promote some emerge, emerging strategic industries. And the top one is energy saving and environmental protection. So hopefully we can bring down this figure to 2.47 terawatts. And by also promoting renewable energies, we hopefully to bring down the percentage of water reliant power generation from 97% to 87%. We will see a lot of increase on wind and solar power generation, but we're still looking at adding uh, power generation of America, UK, and Australia today, and we're also looking at doubling the hydropower generation and doubling the thermal power generation. So do we have enough water to fuel our future power generation, future economic growth? And we published our report Called with HSBC called No Water, No Power, and another report called Water for Coal with COSA to address these issues. And recently, another one, another one is the food security. And we recently published a report called No Water, No Power with HSBC. And because if you look at the top, the fourth province of the top five farming province, which is Hebei, Henan, Shandong, and Jiangsu, they have the water resource similar to the Middle East, including Amman and Pakistan but they produce the same amount of wheat as India and America. So our conclusion is, any water crisis in these top farming provinces will put a risk on the food security and food safety in China. So with these scarcity issues and protein issues, it's really down to choices. Do we eat more meat or do we uh, end up without water? And if you look at the water future, future, future water content, the meat usually uh, uses less water than compared to uh, wheat production. And if uh, a standard weight of a, a state will use 17 bus types of water, and at the same amount of pork will probably use seven bus types of water. So do you eat steak or do you take pork? And for these top four farming provinces, they are producing the same amount of meat and beef as Australia. So this comes to the question, do we continue to grow cows to produce beef, 
or we shift to produce more high, more high value products such as iPod. And there are 500 million people living in dry land provinces. And we will see, we will likely to see the water resource per, per, per person capital, capital, capital to increase in the future. So the allocation of resources are fine balancing to act. So in 2000, 2000, 2000 years, we looking at the water pressure map. China, we still have lots of blue color, which means kind of relaxed water resources. And the red color is high pressure on water resource availability. And over the last 10 years now, there's no blue color left. And most of the regions are in aligning red color. So the underlying water conditions have changed. And over the last 10 years, we have seen the most resource per capita being decreasing because the levels fluctuating because of climate change. And also what we will see water use rise over the past 10 years. And with the increasing urbanization and also the increasing economy, we will likely see the divergent trend to, to, to continue. And also the climate change is exacerbating the water scarcity in China. So we need to know the water risk in China because the waterscape has been changing. So when push comes to shove, here are our options. Desalination, building dams, or divert waters. And we, have, we all know about the South Stream North Diversion Project. And the, the eastern line of this project has been finished. And despite the, the mass spending and also its impact on the, uh, the ecological environment and also the local resettlement, the pricing is also an issue, how to recover the mass uh, cost of this project. Some professor from Beijing said, probably it makes more sense to just invest this money locally to upgrade its treatment facilities and recycled water <coughs> than spending so much money on this project. And about the dining, dining, and we will likely see the adding, China will add 350 gigawatt hydropower, which means we'll probably add 45,000 dams in, in China, and which will mainly located in the southwest of China, where transboundary waters are. So will this, will this increase the risk of geo geopolitical tension in these neighboring countries? Because when it comes to energy security, this kind of risk may not be unaffordable. So, um, so thanks for this uh, opportunity to give the presentation, and we are welcome to visit our website, and we also have a monthly newsletter, and welcome to subscribe to our newsletter. Thank you. Great.